The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Redefining Endometrial and Ovarian Carcinoma Care, Maximizing the Clinical Potential of Immunotherapy, ADCs, PARP Inhibitors, and Other Emerging Treatment Strategies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CVY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Redefining Endometrial and Ovarian Carcinoma Care, Maximizing the Clinical Potential of Immunotherapy, Antibody Drug Conjugates, PARP Inhibitors, and Other Emerging Treatment Strategies, sponsored by Peerview, uh, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, and the Foundation for Women's Cancer. Um, Dr. Kathleen Moore from the Stevenson Cancer Center, and I have the great pleasure of moderating today. And I just wanted to say, we were just commenting, we're like, there's so many people here. Um, for Monday afternoon at SGO. So we're so excited um, that so many of you joined us in person for this session, and we're glad you're here enjoying lunch and hope you enjoy this session, but I'm really pleased to see so many of you here this afternoon. And I'm just gonna get us started with a little bit of an overview introduction. And our goals for today in general are to augment your knowledge of evidence supporting modern treatment approaches for patients with endometrial and ovarian cancer, we're going to share tips from our panelists on integrating the latest options and personalized care plans, taking into consideration guideline recommendations, biomarker status, and available clinical trials. And we're going to try and equip you with skills to confidently create proactive and collaborative strategies to mitigate and manage adverse events. So I'm going to start off just with um, a little bit of demographics and some about um, tumor testing just to set the stage for our two presenters. Uh, and hopefully you've kind of gotten the sense of this at this meeting, but really it is, we are still focused very much on ovarian cancer, but we are finally catching up um, with drug development and therapeutic advances in endometrial cancer. What a time it has been for the past few years to go from paclitaxel and carboplatin alone to now an ever-expanding um, panel, and we'll talk about this, of biomarkers with actual active drugs that help our patients Today we saw, or yesterday, I guess, I don't know what day it is, day of the week it is, at this meeting we saw help them live longer. Like we have improved overall survival, and that is due to many of you in the room and really due to our patients volunteering to be a part of these important trials, and so I could not be more proud. It's especially important because it, for endometrial cancer, it's important for all of our patients, but especially important in endometrial cancer because we're in a bit of a crisis in the United States. And I do think this... Um, um, can be extra, um, taken to some parts of the globe, but not all as well, where endometrial cancer is increasing. It is the only solid tumor increasing in incidence and mortality, at least in the United States right now, um, with no sign of plateauing or stopping. And that's really a huge problem. We're approaching a point where we're going to have mortality rates of endometrial cancer equate equal to those of ovarian cancer, which I don't think we ever imagined we would see, but we're very close to that now, and that's not a good goal to be aspiring to. Um, furthermore, and I think this audience knows this well, while endometrial cancer affects all um, people with, from all um, economic groups and all ethnicities, it disproportionately impacts um, people of color, and especially um, black people of color with a much higher incidence of much more aggressive tumors and a higher mortality. And you can see that highlighted in the um, red box at the kind of the lower middle part of this um, screen. So globally high met need and especially amongst um, some of our populations that have been uh, historically mistreated um, in medicine and it's time to catch up. And so I think we are doing that and continue to focus on all patients, but this group in particular. When we think about why we have made some of these gains in um, endometrial cancer, it really comes from finally being able to put into action what we learned from the TCGA a decade ago. This was a decade ago that this came out, actually 11 years. And we've been referencing it for a long time, but we're finally ac like actionizing it, like using medications in the right patient populations at the right time, and we are seeing these overall survival advantages. And so you, you all know well the four subgroups. I don't need to um, repeat this, um, but we're using this, and we're actually understanding, and we'll talk a little bit more about this today, that it's probably not four groups, is it? 
Um, it's probably poly mismatch repair deficient. This no specific mutation profile is probably at least two, if not three, subgroups. And TP53 is probably at least two and potentially more subgroups. So as we understand this better, our clinical trials are going to get more precise and we're going to move more and more patients, hopefully, into that cure fraction. Certainly the biggest advance um, has been the universal testing and adoption of testing for endometrial specimens um, right now for mismatch repair proficiency um, and microsatellite instability. And you can see just definitions here. I know we have some learners in the room just to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about when we say MMR. You know, let's stop and, and define what we're talking about. So mismatch repair protein complexes, and they're listed here, MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6, are important in how um, tumors and DNA correct mistakes during DNA replication, that's their behavior. And so when you have absence or loss of function in one of these four proteins, it revol results in this deficient mismatch repair status. So this is the cause of microsatellite um, high or microsatellite instability. Not all the cause, there are other reasons tumors can be MSI high, but it's the majority of it. So this MSI high provides phenotypic evidence of deficient mismatch repair. And so we consider MSI high and deficient mismatch repair, the kind of biologically the same population. And that's how we're currently classifying our tumors and identifying patients who right now, like 100% should receive an immune checkpoint inhibitor. It's a little bit different in ovarian cancer where we talk more about homologous recombination deficiency, um, which is inclusive of BRCA. And this is testing in ovarian cancer that at least in the United States is um, uh, widely at least available, less so, but increasingly in the rest of the world. There's a number of ways we look at HRD and you can follow this from left to right. Probably the more um, common is the middle group, which is this genomic instability score, which is compi comprised of three components, loss of heterozygosity, telomeric, telomeric allelic imbalance, and large scale state transitions. And this gives you a genomic instability score. And if it's greater than 42, it's deemed HRD. If it's less than or greater, less than or equal to 42, it's deemed homologous recombination deficiency test negative. We can also look at germline or somatic mutations of genes in the homologous recombination repair pathway, and that's on the far um, uh, left-hand side on your screen. And on the right-hand side is sort of the penultimate goal of homologous recombination repair functional status. Remember, genomic instability is sometimes referred to as a scar. It may not represent what the tumor is doing now. So the goal would be to have a functional test. And RAD51C um, um, foci is the, the test that we'd like to do, but it requires a biopsy. And so really getting this to be an actionable test is something that's of high importance. So really the middle genomic instability scoring is what we're using now. And why do we use that? Because we want to identify tumors that would be more likely than not to respond to a PARP inhibitor. Uh, and I think we all know how PARP inhibitors work, at least I hope by this point. And we're identifying the patients even beyond BRCA who would benefit from PARP inhibitors or other DNA damage response um, sorts of agents. And I know you've seen this um, pie chart by our colleague, Dr. Constantinopoulos, many times. But in green, you can see those tumors that are BRCA deficient, inclusive of BRCA1 promoter methylation, which basically means that the gene is normal, but you don't transcribe the protein. So it acts just like a BRCA mutation. It's 10% of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. It's not a small fraction. Um, and we catch that in these HRD assays. Uh, and you can see the others that contribute to BRCA wild-type HRD in blue. And then on the left-hand side of this pie chart, you can see those tumors and the characteristics of them that are less responsive to PARP inhibitors and are termed homologous recombination deficiency test negative. And then the newest biomarker, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to our colleagues, um, is HER2. So I've said we're all testing for mismatch repair proficiency and deficiency. That's sort of universal. This is sort of the next universal thing I think that we're going to see is HER2 testing. This is data just from serous tumors, where in the red boxes you can see what we classically called HER2 positive, 3 plus, 2 plus ish positive, 18%. If you add in 2 plus ish negative, it's 27% in total. And if you add in 1 plus, you get another 17%. And so you're going to hear about the clinical trials and the data that we know so far with targeting HER2. What we need to figure out is who, is it 1 plus through 3 plus? Is it just 3 plus? Who should be we treating with um, HER2 targeting ADCs and when? Uh, monotherapy or not? Lots of questions, but this is becoming a must test 
for endometrial cancer because we're gonna use antibody drug conjugates. And this is something you're gonna hear a lot about in this, um, in this uh, symposium today. These are antibodies that target a tumor-associated antigen, such as HER2, and they deliver a payload of very potent chemotherapy. It's internalized, and so you're kind of delivering like a Trojan horse, very um, toxic um, agents that you otherwise couldn't give systemically to the cancer via these tumor-associated antigens and having a differentiated side effect profile that hopefully is more favorable to the patient more effective and less toxic. Um, and so we really want to focus on how we are testing and how we're treating and also how we're educating our sites and our patients about access to clinical trials so we can move more of these novel agents that you're going to hear about you know, into our patient populations and then into clinical utility um, if they are positive. And we want to make sure that we're doing this in a very equitable fashion so that we are enrolling patients who are actually at risk for developing and really dying from the diseases that we are testing. And that's going to take very um, intentional education education and effort at the site level to make sure that, that clinical trials are part of the culture and that patients understand kind of what's involved and that there's dual benefit to both them and to the kind of general kind of world at large in terms of um, informing the standard of care or learning from negative trials and moving the field forward. Um, patients really benefit from using reputable sources for their education. I think we all know this. Like we don't like them doing Google searches because um, they get a lot of misinformation, which causes a lot of anxiety. And so I just want to thank pu publicly our patient advocacy group partners, the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition and the Foundation for Women's Cancer, who do a great deal of work to have accurate patient-centered um, education materials for across all gynecologic malignancies for us to give to patients, for patients to access online so they can actually have accurate information to make um, decisions and ask questions about their care and be a participant in decisions surrounding um, th therapeutic decisions. And with that kind of overview, which I know I went a little over and I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Bacchus, who's going to talk about radical changes in the standard of care for recurrent and advanced endometrial cancer. Dr. Bacchus, take it away. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here, and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about this with everybody here. Um, so let's get started. So a lot of changes has happened over this last year, as Dr. Moore already mentioned. And really where we've gone is this combination of immunotherapy and um, chemotherapy with the thought that this can increase tumor sensitivity to pdl one targeted monoclonal antibodies. So the thought was as we started researching this that chemotherapy can induce the upregulation of pdl one on cells, um, facilitate the infiltration of CDK positive T cells and NK cells into the tumor and increase maturation of the antigen presenting cells, including the dendritic cells and tumor macrophages. And you see that kind of under that schema there where we can turn a potentially cold tumor into a hot tumor. And so that was the rationale for both the Ruby um, study and the GY018 study that we'll um, be discussing in a little bit more detail here. So you're likely very familiar with this, so I won't belabor it too much, but this was a tri these were trials for patients with advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer that um, could have had prior chemotherapy if it was for the Ruby trial, that was if it was uh, completed more than six months ago. Patients were then stratified by microsatellite stabil um, uh, stability status, disease status, and radi prior radiation or not. They received chemotherapy with dostarlamab or placebo, and then continued on with dostarlamab or placebo maintenance treatment for up to three years. And here are the um, data, and I was very excited to see this um, updated survival with the Starlamet plus chemotherapy here at um, the SGO meeting, and we saw this on Saturday. So um, what we had seen already in the progression-free survival with the early data um, that there was a substantial benefit was a decrease of 70% in the risk of um, progression or death with the addition of the Starlamet to chemotherapy. And we see that here in the updated data as 
well. And then the um, overall survival, and this is in both in these graphs are both in a mismatch repair deficient population. We see again like almost a 70% risk uh, decreased risk of dying from um, your endometrial cancer. With a th 36 months, we see 78% versus 46% of the patients who were on placebo um, who are still alive. So when we most exciting probably is that we're starting to see those flattening of the curves. And now we have 24 month data, 36 month data, and it doesn't really drop. Whereas those patients on placebo, we see it keep going down. We saw a um, progression-free survival benefit here that has the ratio 0 0.6, so 40% decrease in risk of progression or death from um, if you uh, were on the immunotherapy as well in the mismatch repair deficient population on the right. Left was overall. So this uh, METAS primary, this trial METAS primary endpoint showing that there was an improvement in PFS and we also um, are continuing to follow these patients for um, overall survival. So GY018 was a similarly designed trial. Um, prior chemotherapy was allowed if it was more than 12 months ago. Patients were enrolled into two cohorts. These were separately powered. Um, so it's really kind of two studies in one, which is a big difference from the Ruby study. Um, and here we uh, was chemotherapy with pembrolizumab versus placebo, and immunotherapy was continued as maintenance for two years. Um, here's the data in the, uh, on the left in the DMMR cohort, on the right in the PMMR cohort. And we see the median progression-free survival was not reached in the DMMR cohort versus 7.7 .7 months with um, placebo. And on the right, we see a similar um, progression-free survival in a placebo group and a median progression-free survival of 13.1 months. Again, hazard ratios, um, 0 0.3, so very similar to the RUBY trial in a mismatch repair deficient population and mismatch repair proficient population was 0 0.54, um, so also pretty close to what we saw on the Ruby study with their updated data. Um, here at SGO, we um, saw some trends, and this is still very early. There was only about 18% maturity for um, overall survival, so we're going to need to wait for some more data, but the curves definitely are, favor uh, are looking favorable. On the left, we see the overall survival data for the mismatch repair deficient population, and on the right, in the proficient population. Again, follow-up um, times are uh, quite kind of short still, so, um, but we see the curves go in the right direction, despite the fact that a lot of these patients received, if you were in a placebo group, they received um, later on immunotherapy. So that also shows us that it's really important to use these drugs up front. And even if we use it up front, we still, um, despite the crossover, we still see that overall survival, um, either already seen that there's a um, benefit there or a trend at least towards it. Um, similarly, in the 10 study, this was atezolizumab. So, and all these trials kind of give us the same similar results, which is very reassuring. So here, this was, um, again, recurrent endometrial cancer, prior chemotherapy was allowed. Again, this was over um, six months, if, if chemotherapy was over six months or more. Um, the stratification factors are slightly different. And then we saw atezolizumab uh, with chemotherapy versus placebo. We saw the benefit here, again, with that similar hazard ratio of 0 0.36, um, big improvement in the DMMR population um, and compared to the placebo. So PFS was improved in the uh, intent to treat population, and we see this also um, highlighted here in the DMMR curves. Then on to DUOE. So DUOE did the, uh, was with Durvalumab with chemotherapy, but now we see this, the trials um, that was randomized in three different arms. First arm was um, Durvalumab um, or, or the placebo arm, then chemotherapy with Durvalumab and followed um, by Durvalumab maintenance. And then in arm C, we see Durvalumab and Olaparib maintenance. 
And here's what we see in the intended to read population. So we see this, this is the progression free survival, where we see the median progression free survival of 15 months with, um, for the patients that were on Dovalumab with Laparib, compared to 10 months in the Dovalumab arm. Um, and the control arm was 9.6. And the comparisons are all made compared to the control arm. So there wasn't an official comparator between the Dovalumab with the laparib versus the dervalumab, and that's an important thing to remember. But the differences compared to the control arm without immunotherapy we see here, this is the 21% um, at 18 months versus 30, almost 38% and 46% um, still progression free. When we split those out in DMMR and the PMMR population, we see still that benefit. But when we look at those DMMR curves, you see that that curve for um, Dervalumab with Olaparib is pretty close to the one from Dervalumab um, alone. So probably a little bit less benefit or um, significantly less benefit in, um, in the DMMR population of the addition of Olaparib. Whereas in the PMMR population, we see um, um, a hazard ratio of 0.57 from of development with a lap versus control and 0.77 um, for development versus control. Um, this, this differentiation between the curves and the treatment groups was um, mostly seen in the pdl one positive population. And um, I think we're gonna le learn a little bit more about that. What was this pdl one population later this afternoon? So the session this afternoon with the late breaking will have a lot, of more, lot more updates on DOE and some of the other endometrial cancer trials. It certainly is endometrial cancer having you. I was kind of, kind of glad that it comes after this. So don't, <laughs> we don't have to go over all of that in detail yet. It's so much to interpret. Um, so here's what we're going to see this afternoon. The DOE updated overall survival. They're going to look at some mismatch repair deficient status. Um, what is that PDL one and in a patient perspective also. Um, these are the trials that have completed enrollment. And this is really where is this field going? Are we going to be using immunotherapy? Yes, in a recurrent setting, but are we even maybe going to replace or, um, chemotherapy with immunotherapy or immunotherapy combination? So Keynote C93 is has completed enrollment. This was pembrolizumab versus carboplatin paclitaxel. This was specifically for the mismatch repair deficient population. Dominica has a similar patient population, but compared to Starlimab with carboplatin paclitaxel, so that's a different standard arm, um, but we'll still be able to get some, um, some important results from those trials. And then LEAP001 has been um, uh, reported just last week at ESCO, and we're gonna see that presentation um, here this afternoon, and I'm very excited to, um, to learn more about that, for, and especially since probably most of us were not at ESCO. Um, and that was a lymphatina pembrolizumab uh, compared to chemotherapy. Didn't meet its primary endpoint, um, but the details, and they'll have some information also on the PMMR versus the DMMR population and, um, and some um, similarities. But overall, these outcomes were looked fairly similar in times for progression-free survival and overall survival um, in both groups for the um, PMMR population. So still can be a, um, an important alternative to chemotherapy, I would say. As we use more of these immunotherapies, we have to be very mindful also about the side effects that come with that. And especially if we have patients on these drugs for long periods of time, two years um, with Pembro, three years with the Starlimab, and a 10th was given, and in DOE, the Dervalumab um, was given indefinitely. So, um, and, and we probably have all had these patients with these side effects in our practice. Dermatologic, rash, pruritus, the GI side effects of diarrhea, colitis, nausea, vomiting, endocrine, of course, um, thyroiditis, hypothyroidism um, as a longer effect, and um, pneumonitis, along with nephritis, hepatitis, and really anything that you can imagine can happen with immunotherapy. And this is treated very differently. There's no dose reductions, no, it's all with holding the drug and treating with steroids and making sure that you have a network around you of other very um, patient, of other specialties and colleagues around, the, um, around our specialty also who use these drugs and have seen some of these side effects. And I'm sure we've all talked about, oh, 
I had this strange case and what would you do? And we talk and I think this is really important as we learn and we learn from each other also not to miss these important side effects and to initiate treatment early because with early treatments, um, these are very manageable and hopefully we can get these patients again back on these very effective drugs. Um, this is kind of a graph of where the timeline is and skin rash paritis happened a little bit earlier in the first couple of weeks on treatment as does colitis. But these really can, these curves are not set in stone. This can happen at any point in time. Endocrinopathies you see continue to go on. Pneumonitis peaks a little bit later but we should always be very vigilant. Um, but also tell our patients this is about when it can happen but it doesn't have to, can be at any time, and report those symptoms that um, they may just look over. What else is out there? So um, we talked a lot about immunotherapy, and we saw absolutely in DMMR, immunotherapy is absolutely key. But in PMMR, we see benefit. Um, but we also have some uh, important emerging approaches that we can use for the PMMR population that we haven't had. And it's exciting to see that also for this population, we have some uh, starting to see some options. And so one of those is XP01, um, export in one. So this is a major new nuclear transport for tumor suppressor proteins, such as P53, P10, FOXO1. And so inhibition of XPO1 results in increased nuclear levels of an activation of these tumor suppressor proteins and a reduction of oncoprotein levels. So Selenexor is an example of those um, of an oral selective XPO1 inhibitor. And this has been shown in preclinical data, at least, that it reactivates multiple tumor suppressor um, uh, proteins, preventing nuclear export. Uh, and we've seen also some data here in a GYN space in endometrial cancer in particular. So the Ciendo trial was a maintenance therapy with Selenexor after carboplatin paclitaxel chemotherapy. So patients were eligible if they had uh, first relapse of their endometrial cancer, they received chemotherapy and then um, had either a partial response or a complete response to their treatments. They were stratified by this, whether they had primary or recurrent and PR or CR. And then they were randomized to Selenexor um, and you can see the dosing on here versus placebo. Primary endpoint was PFS. And they had a predefined explore, had these predefined exploratory endpoints, um, which included a histological subtype and then a molecular classification, as Dr. Moore um, explained to us. And so here are the long-term follow-up of the Ciendo data. This is progression-free survival in P53 wild type and the P53 mutant or abnormal subgroups. We see here that on the left, and this is probably something that maybe not everybody expected to see here, but in the P53 um, wild type group, we saw a big difference with, the difference with this long-term follow-up for the patients who were on Selenexor. They um, had a median progression-free survival of 27 months uh, compared to 5.2 months for placebo. So big difference here. Um, and that was regardless of MSI status, and you see those numbers um, listed down below. So um, in the P53 mutant or abnormal group, we see that the um, Selenexor and um, placebo did not uh, show any significant difference um, between these curves and even placebo being slightly above this. Some of the, the side effects that we see with this is neutropenia, nausea, thrombocytopenia, but fortunately there were no great um, five AEs that occurred. And we now have a um, follow-up uh, study, also confirmatory study ongoing. Specifically, this was a, a trial for all comers, but the current trial that's enrolling is specifically for that P53 wild type recurrent endometrial cancer population. So hopefully these, those results will confirm um, the exciting signal that we see here. We talked a little bit about this and how important immunotherapy is um, in the front line. Um, what that's going to mean for our second line, we really don't know yet. Um, until recently, after chemotherapy, then a second line treatment in the PMMR population was lymphatinib pembrolizumab, probably a 
next first choice. Um, and so here we see, um, and this was one of the first trials to really show that benefit of lymphatinib pembrolizumab over physician choice chemotherapy with either doxorubicin or weekly paclitaxel and an improvement in progression-free survival of 6.7 months versus 3.8 months, 40% decrease in the risk of progression or death, and even an um, overall survival benefit here of len lenvatinib with pembrolizumab of 18 months over chemotherapy 12 months. The response rates were doubled um, here also with a doubling of the complete responses and a median duration um, of response also was doubled with lenvatinib pembrolizumab. We've, over the last few years, I think most of us will have gotten very familiar managing these TKIs, and that's another unique set. And we've learned to manage immunotherapy toxicities, TKI toxicities, um, and this is really the TKI is obviously a much shorter half-life um, than any of the other drugs that we use. Um, so holding the drug for when we see toxicity, um, supportive care, and then restarting at a dose reduction typically, and managing the symptoms also with antihypertensives and you can see some of those um, side effects that we see here on the right in the TK in the um, table in the dark blue hypertension changes in taste stomatitis dyspepsia pepsia cytopenias of course press as um, associated with hypertension or even without um, on the left more of the IO toxicities and certainly there's a bunch of um, overlapping um, uh, toxicity here also that we have to be um, vigilant for. Any other tra therapeutic strategies? And we never thought that we'd be talking about this many um, options for endometrial cancer just even a year or two ago. Um, but this is so exciting. And um, and this has been presented here at the recent meeting also. And Dr. Moore explained there, to us already uh, the importance of HER2 testing, specifically because we have drugs available for this now. And this is one of the examples of the HER2 targeting um, um, antibody drug conjugates. This is trastuzumab um, deruxtecan, so or a short um, TDXD. This is the payload. is a toposomerase one inhibitor. Um, and it, the Destiny Pan tumor looked at multiple different cohorts, and this was specifically effective in the GYN space, uh, which gave us now options for endometrial cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer. And while it's not FDA approved yet, it is available on um, uh, as or listed as part of the NCCN. Uh, Follow-up studies are ongoing. Um, this was all based on local testing and patient had central testing then too. Um, and when we look at this here, so this trial was actually designed for patients with HER2 um, IHC 3 plus or 2 plus. Um, and, um, uh, but once they did the central testing also, they saw that some patients who had 1 plus or even um, IHCs her to uh, zero scores were included in this trial. And the cohorts are overall small, so we'll need to see some follow-up of the longer cohorts, but this is, was very impressive data um, of, for all patients across the board here, an objective response rate of 57.5%. You see the curves here. The IHC 3 plus seemed to have the best um, progression-free survival, followed by those um, with the two um, and the, or and followed by the two and the green lines are the overall cohort. So longer follow-up needed and certainly bigger cohorts as these are still pretty small, but very exciting data. And there are multiple ADCs under development also in endometrial cancer. We have um, another drug, the BNT323, which also is targeting HER2 um, linked to toposomerase um, 1 inhibitor. Um, we have now also folate receptor alpha um, targeting drugs with mervatoximab, um, immunogen 151, which is a bispecific antibody, um, antibody drug conjugate also. Um, and then we have trope 2 targeting with several drugs. Um, these drugs have different payloads also, and we're going to see um, some very great new opportunities for our endometrial cancer patients. Wonderful. Thank you. And we're gonna move on to a case that we're gonna discuss, and then we actually have a lot of questions from you, and we're gonna try and answer some of your questions as we discuss the case. So I'll call them out as we get to them. 
But this is a case discussion. So this is a patient who was diagnosed in 2019, 61 years old. She presented initially with stage 3C2 uh, clear cell carcinoma. She had a huge uterine mass and um, positive pelvic and paritic lymph nodes that were resected. Um, she uh, got six cycles of paclitaxel carboplatin, because that's what we were using at the time, had some limiting neuropathy, but otherwise um, did okay and had good response of any remaining measurable dis um, disease. But she recurred pretty quick. Um, April 2020, um, she had recurrence about five months after completing chemotherapy, and I met her in our phase one clinical trials unit. She did not want LENPEM. Um, and so we went, because of the clear cell, we went with a very novel mTOR inhibitor, and she did great. Just like the, again, speaking just to the importance of clinical trials, um, she got a lot of clinical benefit out of this, um, 19 cycles with a partial response um, and tolerated it really well, but eventually progressed. While she was on that, we sent her tumor for molecular profiling at just a larger panel with immunohistochemistry added, given sort of the data that had been emerging. And she was found to be, not surprisingly, microsatellite stable or mismatch repair proficient, but she did have a HER2 or BB2 amplification. Um, on that finding. And so she um, recurred again, and because there'd been such a long time from her first adjuvant chemotherapy, and then she had this intervening um, targeted therapy, we just um, decided to initiate paclitaxel and carboplatin um, plus pembrolizumab at that time. So this was almost a year ago. Uh, and she remains on now monotherapy pembrolizumab at this time. Was, her chemo was discontinued after about six cycles. She had a complete response and remains in complete remission um, at this time happily. Uh, and so this is sort of one um, case. You can kind of see that cases are unique, right? This is not the typical um, trajectory of things that you use, but sometimes we make decisions in clinical practice that are a little bit different. So we're going to discuss this. I think, do I have questions? Yeah. So this is just, um, just what I was saying, sort of the we put up these algorithms of how you should think about things. Uh, and this may be the future of what we're thinking about. On the left-hand side, you see a patient whose tumor is mismatch repair deficient microsatellite unstable or pol -E, I, I think we can all agree based on what Dr. Bacchus and others have just presented, the standard of care is chemotherapy plus checkpoint inhibitor and checkpoint inhibitor maintenance for either two or three years, depending on which of the two studies you believe. We can talk about that actually. Um, or potentially we do move to immunotherapy alone and we'll see what the results of C93 are. And for mismatch repair proficient tumors, if you look at the far right-hand side, we do have data, and you saw the data, the updated OS data at this meeting by Dr. Eskander, that there is an overall survival advantage when you add checkpoint inhibitor. It's modest, but it's there. And so we can talk about whether we think that is the standard of care or an option. And then we're emerging HER2 um, positive tumors. There's an ongoing uh, clinical trial led by Britt Erickson that is enrolling patients who, with serous tumors that are HER2 3 plus or 2 plus ish, so the kind of traditional positive, because it's paclitaxel carboplatin with trastuzumab pertuzumab followed by trastuzumab pertuzumab maintenance. And so that's an important study moving an antibody into the front line. And then for this group of patients who are this no specific mutation profile where these are endocrine driven, beta catenin, TP53, P10, um, not TP53, sorry, PIC3, um, P10 um, um, uh, uh, tumors, you know, should we be using immunotherapy or do we need to be using endocrine therapy? Or the, um, as Dr. Bacchus alluded to, um, SIN inhibitors or other, um, or do you, or are we using IO in everyone? Like these are the questions. You know, and then where does PARP layer in? You know, this is sort of the next question you've heard, do we at ESMO? And you'll hear some updates this afternoon, so we'll get you out on time for that. And you heard Ruby part two at this meeting. Um, both positive studies, but with some, you know, things we wish we had done a little bit differently. And so is that definitive and where does PARP layer in? And then we talked about, you heard, talked quite a bit about, you know, how what we do in the front line impacts what we do at the time of recurrence. Once somebody recurs, what do you use? So if you use a checkpoint inhibitor in the front line, your, your options in the second line are many. You could use, if they're HER2 positive, you could use a HER2 ADC. If they're endocrine receptor positive, you could potentially use endocrine therapy. 
You could use a checkpoint inhibitor plus another novel IO combination on clinical trial. And there's so many ADCs, you just heard Dr. Bacchus list them. There's so many ADCs entering phase three registration enabling clinical trials for patients with endometrial cancer. That I think we're actually going to have a pipeline of active therapies for the first time in my career um, available off clinical trial. So that's exciting. Endocrine therapy, what if somebody had endocrine therapy to start? We kind of forget this. Sometimes patients have ER-driven tumors and they present with small lung nodules and we start them on megase tamoxifen or everolimus letrozole and they kind of cruise along for a long time and now they have recurred. Um, um, you know, what do you use in that setting? And you kind of are back to all the frontline options or, you know, you can move to um, immune checkpoint inhibitors for microcyte instable, and then LENPEM would be on label for second, um, second line, as you just heard. And then for patients who get chemotherapy with trastuzumab, pertuzumab, which I just showed you Dr. Erickson's study, and that is an NCCN listed combination. Again, most of these, <coughs> sorry, are gonna be microcytolite stable. And so your standard would be LENPEM. But as you see the emerging data with HER2 ADCs, and maybe even we see some more data with TROPE2 ADCs, <coughs> I'm so sorry, you know, how are you going to sequence that? Is, is it LENPEM for everyone, or would you rather use an antibody drug conjugate? I'm not making, I mean, maybe I am making a judgment call of what I would do since I put the question there, but I mean, I don't know what the best option is. But it's nice to have two options, um, it's nice for our patients. And so let's talk a little bit about this case. We have a few minutes um, before we have to move on, and we have a few questions we can get to. So what do you think, um, Dr. Pothuri, I'll start with you. What do you think about you know, that patient now? Let's, we can kind of take out the mTOR in the middle. That is what happened, but we can take that out. She got adjuvant taxol carbo, and then three years later kind of recurs, and you know, now you're faced with how you're going to, to treat her. She's microsatellite stable. Um, you know, what's your option, and is it... Is it IO in everybody based on 018 and Ruby? Would you layer in a PARP? In whom are you gonna layer in a PARP? That's a question, a couple of questions from the audience said, when will you add a PARP or would you? That's a great question. And so I definitely like the idea of going back to chemotherapy given you know the long disease-free interval of three years. And in this scenario, especially with a clear cell, um, I like the idea of immunotherapy, so the way this patient was treated with pembrolizumab. Um, ideally, given that she was HER2 positive, I wish we had data with um, IO and a HER2 ADC. Uh, however, you know, with the data that we have at present, I, like, I, would, I would choose um, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. Now, the question of whether we add a PARP inhibitor based on the duo e trial um, I think is you know that's a positive trial but I think it's it's difficult to interpret and you know the way I look at that data I think if I saw the patient had some kind of either a BRCA mutation or an HRRM mutation I would definitely also add a PARP inhibitor into the maintenance of that patient and then um, I want to get a couple of these, and then we're going to move to your, your talk to keep us on time. But these are really great questions. If um, you know, this is a question from the audience, and it's a good one. If you're going to add a PARP, let's say she's got a BRCA, or you just believe the data and you want to use it, what is it more complicated day to day? This person is acting, asking, what about the toxicities? Is the benefit worth the risk? Kind of how do you how do you think about that from the patient standpoint? Yeah, I think there's multiple. There's the, of course, there's the toxicity profile. And yes, you add, they're very different toxicity profiles. So they're probably not um, synergistic or at least, um, but they they do add up. Um, you have the IO toxicities, the PARP with the um, cytopenias, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, of course, that we'll see. Um, but in addition to also think what you said from a patient perspective, the cost aspect um, comes with that too. Um, and now we have and immunotherapy and a PARP. Um, and I wish there wasn't any cost associated with any care because 
everybody should have. Um, I would love that if everybody had every option, but it is another thing to consider because not everything is covered for every patient. Um, and they may have high co-pays, even if insurance pays for that. So yeah, another thing to points. consider. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, in terms of the adverse events. So the DOE data showed that like when you look at it in the maintenance period, that it was pretty tolerable and the discontinuation rate was about 14%, which I think is pretty reasonable. So it is a strategy that I think is, you know, not going to add a whole lot of um, additional toxicity to our patients um, as we're thinking about it. Yeah. And we're very used to it from the ovarian pop population, of course, absolutely. We know how to manage those. Yeah. Let's do one more before we get to Dr. Pothuri, because I think this is a great question, and, and there's so much endometrial to cover, and this answers two questions. For mismatch or pair proficient, are, should, is there anybody, there's two questions here. Is any of, are any of those patients just gonna get chemo, or are all patients getting chemo, immunotherapy, and if you progress in this regimen, does that eliminate LENPEM? Let's answer, you two can answer those two questions, and then we'll go to the next um, section. What do you think? I think we have options now for patients. Like if they haven't had chemotherapy, yes. Um, chemotherapy is probably is gonna come first uh, and chemotherapy with IO in particular. So um, the LEAP001 from what we know from what has been presented, but we'll see a little bit more there, that there weren't significant differences when you did chemotherapy versus um, LEN-PEM, but now the current standard is going towards chemotherapy with IO. So I think we have, for that patient in the PMMR population would consider um, chemotherapy with IO. Um, I think what was your, the second part was... Would you use LENPEM if they progressed on... On, on IO, on, yeah. Progressed on PEMBRO, mismetropair proficient. Is LENPEM your first choice for second line? Gosh, this is... It's a hard question. Um, Yes, and but um, there's still an option there. It's also nice if we have another option with something on trial, an ADC that you could sequence in between, and can you come back to it at that point rather than adding the lymphadenib to the pembrolizumab. So if that is an option, I would probably put that in a different drug in between before I go back to LENPEM, but I don't think it has excluded LENPEM necessarily. Yeah, I think... Um, I think the chemotherapy plus IO is a standard, as you said, um, and I think that um, I I do think that we have we can improve upon the outcomes that we've seen. So my first thought is to try to put those patients on a trial. So if they're p53 wild type, I'll try to put them on the um, export EC trial. If they're HER2 positive, I have GYO26 open, so I'll try to put them on that trial. Um, but I, you know, I also sometimes think about like the histology. If it's a clear cell, then I'm more likely to use IO. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know, I really it depends on the patient sitting in front of me. Yeah. yeah. Let's get you up here to talk. This particular patient was clear cell, like you said. Yeah, that's. So she wasn't eligible for 026. So I kind of weighed those things, but then she wasn't eligible, and I made the right choice in retrospect. So welcome, Dr. Pothuri, to the stage to talk about up, upgrading the treatment algorithm for advanced ovarian cancer. Thank you. Great. So I think um, we all are familiar with our FDA approved PARP inhibitors in the first line maintenance in patients with newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer. Um, so grateful for Katie to lead Solo One that has established um, Olaparib as a standard of care for patients with BRCA mutations, um, Prima, which um, looked at all comers, uh, and Neraparib um, is um, now available um, for all patients in the frontline maintenance setting for ovarian, ovarian cancer. And then the Paola one data that um, enables us to use Olaparib and Bevacizumab in patients who are HRD positive. So um, this is... Uh, I feel kind of weird presenting your data, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, remarkable data that you see here from Solo One, um, seven-year follow-up overall survival um, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.55, um, um, and that is a 45% um, reduction um, of death. So really, I mean, look at the curves, so impressive. Uh, and then 
Prima, um, similar long-term follow-up, um, PFS data. We still um, don't have the overall survival data, but the um, median follow-up at three and a half years um, seems to uh, show continued benefit, both um, in the HRD and in the overall population. And then the Paola 1 data, which is Olaparib um, plus Bevacizumab, uh, and you can see that the hazard ratio in the HRD positive, including the t, t BRCA, was 0 0.33, and then the HRD excluding the t BRCA, the hazard ratio was 0 0.43. Um, you can see that there was no benefit in the HRD um, negative or unknown, um, which is why the indication is in the HRD positive um, subset. And then we also have um, final overall survival in the Paola 1 trial. And again, you can see the benefit both in the BRCA mutated as well as in the HRD positive, excluding the BRCA um, mutated patients uh, and, and no benefit in the HRD. And, you know, potentially even a detriment. Um, you're looking at those median survival. Uh, overall survivals of 25.7 versus 32 months in the placebo plus BEV arm. So that's, um, it's a good thing we're not using it in that subset. Um, right? And then in terms of FDA, um, just to review the FDA approvals again, Neraparib in the frontline maintenance setting, Neraparib is approved um, for all comers. The Olaparib is approved for germline or somatic um, uh, BRC alterations, and then Olaparib and Bevacizumab in germline or somatic alterations and or HRD positive tumors. And I think, um, you know, there have been just some updated indications in terms of the second line maintenance, which I think are worth just reviewing. So Neraparib, um, and the treatment of um, recurrent platinum sensitive as a maintenance treatment is um, now uh, only for germline BRCA um, altered uh, patients. Olaparib is for germline or somatic. And then Rucaparib is also for germline or somatic. And then I think it's important to note that there has been a withdrawal of um, PARP inhibitors as treatment um, in the recurrent setting. Uh, and, you know, if um, you do have a patient on this, obviously um, this needs to be a conversation with the patient. So what about triplet combinations um, as maintenance setting, uh, as maintenance therapy in the frontline setting? So we have several trials here. The trial that um, looks at um, Olaparib plus um, Derva and Bevacizumab, uh, the data will go through that, did show um, this was a positive trial and did show an improved um, PFS benefit um, over um, uh, the um, control arm. Keylink 001 um, was with Olaparib and Pembrolizumab, and we're awaiting data for that trial. And then first, which is also Dr. Moore's trial, it is um, Neraparib and Distralimab, and we are also awaiting data for that trial. So this is the um, DUO-O, which was a phase three trial, looking at the combination of chemotherapy plus bevacizumab and DERVA plus or minus Olaparib. And it was um, newly diagnosed FIGO stage three or four patients, no prior systemic therapy, uh, part, um, primary debulking or planned interval debulking, the stratification factors were timing uh, um, and outcomes of cytoreductive surgery and region. And patients were randomized to these three arms. So just to simplify, arm one, after chemotherapy, arm one was really um, with bevacizumab. Arm two was um, bevacizumab and derva. And then arm three was bevacizumab, derva, and olaparib. And the primary endpoint was investigator-assessed PFS, but it was, control, it was comparing arm one and arm three. So unfortunately, this trial did not compare arm two or three to really sort out the contribution of the PARP inhibitor. And so this is the um, 
PFS um, in the ITT population, ARM3 versus ARM1. And you can see here the hazard ratio was 0 0.63, um, and this met its primary endpoint. In the um, non-TBRCA HRD population, um, also was um, positive, a hazard ratio of 0 0.49. Um, and again, uh, you know, this was ARM1 compared to ARM3, so it is really unfortunate that we don't have that, um, you know, uh, that we don't understand the contribution of the laparib here. Um, Today, there are going to be updated results from Duo O. Um, it'll be a late breaking um, at 2.30. So um, come hear the rest of the story. Um, so what are the, obviously, I think we're all used to using these agents. Um, but it's really important that we think about the adverse events because these are maintenance therapies. Patients have to take them every day, um, and that can be for two to three years. So it's important that we um, pay attention to these. Um, and in terms of hematologic, um, we're really looking at anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, non-hematologic, the most common are nausea, vomiting, um, asthenia, fatigue, um, or diarrhea, constipation, and then really rare but super important are the AML, MDS, and very occasionally I have had one patient who had pneumonitis, and it is kind of a, a real bummer um, to have a patient on a maintenance therapy develop pneumonitis um, where they're short of breath just taking a walk. So I think um, we do have to keep that in mind. So um, how do we manage these in terms of hematologic AEs? Um, you can you in, um, interrupt the treatment, um, monitor their counts until they're grade one or resolved, um, and then you can restart um, at a reduced dose. So I think it's really important that, you know, we think, you know, hold the drug and then dose reduce, and you can get patients through this. It's very, very uncommon that I have to really take a patient off a PARP inhibitor. Um, you know, with niraparib, you do need to do those um, weekly uh, counts when they start for a month um, because of the risk of the thrombocytopenia. Also, you do you should probably you should use the individualized dosing um, based on weights and plates. Um, and then, um, in terms of the non-hematologic, you know, it's really the nausea. So, considering antiemetics, um, utilizing things like ginger candy or um, you know other. Um, non-medical um, options are also um, okay. Um, you can also um, mitigate the nausea by having them take it at bedtime. However, it can also cause insomnia. So, um, you know, if that is not, if nausea is not a concern, then you can have them take it in the morning. Um, and then others use ginseng um, to help with fatigue. Uh, in terms of hypertension, you know, niraparib is the one that does, um, is associated with hypertension, so really just keeping on top of the, their blood pressures. So let's um, switch gears and talk about um, the role for antibody drug conjugates in ovarian cancer. Again, I'm presenting Dr. Moore's study. I feel kind of weird, but um, so um, this trial um, is targeting FR alpha in ovarian cancer. Um, Mirasol phase three trial um, that um, looked at patients who were platinum resistant that had FR alpha um, greater than or equal to 75% high grade um, serous histology um, and uh, prior bevacizumab and PARP inhibitors were allowed and um, patients were randomized to, to MERV or investigators choice chemotherapy and this included paclitaxel, PLD or topo -tican. They randomized one to one. The stratification factors were a type of chemo and prior lines of therapy, one versus two versus three. The primary endpoint was um, PFS by investigator, and the secondary endpoints um, were OS, um, ORR by investigator, and PROs. Um, this led to, um, given um, these uh, data, this led to accelerated FDA approval um, based on the prior phase two Soraya trial um, that was, it was a single arm, uh, actually it was a single arm phase three trial um, that led to the accelerated approval and then Dr. Moore confirmed it um, with this phase three trial. So this is um, 
showing you the data. So we see that MERV improved both PFS and OS, and this is the first time that we have seen this in platinum-resistant disease, so really quite impressive. We saw a 35% percent, um, uh, improvement in PFS. Um, the hazard ratio was actually 0.65, so it was really a 35% percent a reduction in the hazard of um, progression or death. And then we saw a 33% percent, um, in the OS, 33% reduction um, in the hazard of death, which is really impressive. Um, and the objective response rate more than doubled, 42 versus 16% with MERV versus chemotherapy. Um, the other day we had, on Monday, we, Monday? No. Oh my God, I'm losing my mind. Um, on Saturday, we had <laughs> Dr. Konecki present the, um, the patient reported outcomes data for this trial. Um, and this was, um, he looked at the OV28, um, HR quality of life for GI um, uh, symptoms. And you can see on the right here that um, the MERV is the red, um, and there was a reduction in symptoms or an improvement in GI symptoms um, across um, time points. Um, so really nice data um, that uh, shows that um, there were um, significant improvements in GI um, adverse events. Um, so Gloriosa, um, is the phase three trial that is currently ongoing, and it is in the platinum sensitive space, and it is you, it is looking at patients who are FR alpha high, so that is that greater than um, or equal to 75 percent, and after completing. Uh, triplet therapy, so with a platinum-based triplet therapy and bevacizumab, if they have had a CR or PR or stable disease, then they are um, allowed to enroll on this trial and get randomized to MERV plus bevacizumab or bevacizumab. And the stratification factors in this trial are prior PARP, prior bevacizumab, and, whether they, and the response that they had to their platinum CR, PR, or stable disease. Um, so if you have this trial, please help enroll. We want to get um, we want to get this moved up into an earlier line, um, given that this is a very active um, agent in ovarian cancer, and it's also very tolerable. So speaking of other ADCs, um, Floor presented the uh, data for. Uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan in endometrial cancer, and here's the data in ovarian cancer. Again, it's important to keep in mind these are small cohorts, 40 patients, um, and when you look at the green, that's all of the, the overall response rate was 45%, but then when you break it down by IHC 3 plus, 64%, 2 plus, 37%, and um, again, even in this cohort, there were um, there, was, there were responses even in IHC zero. And it's also important to keep in mind that this is based on the gastric scoring um, in terms of the HER2 IHC. And then over to the right, very similar to what Flora presented, you can see that there were differences in the three plus and two plus. Um, however, I think that it's really hard to make any sense of this because these confidence intervals all overlap, so I think it's really hard to say that they're really different. Um, this is obviously something that we do need to sort out in the trials that are ongoing, um, and hopefully we'll have an answer whether there is truly a difference in the three plus. Although it is pretty provocative that the, the median duration of responses is nearly um, double in the um, two plus versus three plus. So other ADCs in ovarian cancer that are being evaluated or um, that we've seen some preliminary data in, MORAB202, this is another ADC that's been um, evaluated against FR alpha in platinum resistant ovarian cancer. Um, there have been some issues with um, 
uh, pneumonitis with this agent. Um, however, the response rate, the objective response rate was 32% um, in the 0.9 milligram per kilogram and almost 50% in the 1.2, which is also the dose they saw the higher incidence of the pneumonitis. Another agent that Dr. Moore, you're presenting everything, Katie. <laughs> Um, um, that uh, she presented, which was really exciting, I think, um, on, Mon on Saturday as well in the opening plenary, is RDXD, um, and this is a ADC that's targeted against um, Cadherin-6, um, CDH-6. Um, really impressive um, responses that were seen, almost 50%. Um, one CR, um, so and, and a disease control rate of you know almost 100 percent, 97 percent. So clearly a really impressive agent and well tolerated to to boot. Um, so this has led to um, Rejoice, um, which is a phase two, three randomized study of RDXD in platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And um, Dr. Deb Richardson is leading this. It is really exciting. Um, this is for platinum resistant ovarian cancer, one to three prior lines. Um, prior MERV um, if they were FR alpha high um, and no prior CDH targeting agents or um, an ADC that has a TOPO1 inhibitor since that is the cytotoxic payload. Um, and then platinum refractory diseases disease is not eligible. There is a seamless um, phase two to three design to really um, do a dose optimization, pick the dose, and then move into your phase three, which is um, a randomization at the appropriate dose to um, physician's uh, choice chemotherapy of gemcitabine, PLD, topotecan, and paclitaxel, primary endpoint of objective response rate, um, and then PFS by Bicker. So um, as Dr. Moore pointed out earlier, um, there are some great um, patient education resources. So please um, you know, utilize these, the NOCC, the FWC, and, and the NCI, um, the NCI PDQ are all great resources for patients. And I think that's it. That's it, thank yeah. you so much. Of course. All right, I'm gonna stay here. Um, um, so we can answer some questions. Uh, we have what case, and then we're going to answer the rest of these audience questions because you guys have been sending them in fast and furious. So I want to be able to um, answer these. So this is um, answer that, and I'll start because um, I want to get you to the next session on time. So this is a patient, um, another patient from my site. She um, has there's two of them. She's platinum resistant ovarian cancer. She is full receptor alpha high, 75 percent, um, two plus or three plus. She was treated with mervituximab and responded great. And around cycle eight, she had some ground glass opacities develop on her CT scan. Patient scenario two is a different patient uh, at my site who uh, also had platinum resistant ovarian cancer, uh, had HER2 um, IHC3 plus. She was on um, TDXD, she was actually on a different one on a clinical trial, but a very similar drug and also had um, around six months in development of ground glass opacities um, on CT scan. So neither of them had symptoms, both felt great, both responding to their therapy and very pleased um, about it. So I just wanted to open the discussion just around, let's talk about just um, antibody drug conjugates and HER2 a little bit so we can answer some of these questions before we talk about pneumonitis. Um, let's talk about patient scenario two. There's a question from the audience, which I think is the good one. TDXD is approved in HER2 low in breast cancer. In Gynonc, you know, we've tested gastric 2 plus 3 plus. You both brought that up from Destiny Pan Tumor. And the question is, it's NCC enlisted 2 plus 3 plus. We'll see what the FDA approval is. But can this be used? This place is 3 plus. Can this be used in HER2 low? 1 plus, 2 plus ish negative. You know, what do we know about who can, who should get access to HER2 ADCs based on testing? We'll start with, with that one. You want to start, Floor? Sure. We'll give Bob uh, his voice a break. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. So, yeah, like you said, it's two plus three plus is listed in the NCCN, um, and without an FDA approval, we're still going by that. The study is done in two plus three plus, so 
Um, that would be my starting point, but have I treated it with OnePlus? Yes. And have I seen responses? Yes. So I don't think we can exclude it. We need more data. We need bigger cohorts. We need to put these patients on trial. And the fact that um, TDXD is NCCN listed, um, I don't think it's going to exclude us testing more of these HER2 targeting antibodies because they're all optimizing, just as there's three different PARP inhibitors um, on the market, I think we'll also see multiple HER2 targeting ADCs that all may be a little bit different and slightly different in some specific side effect profiles. So I think still very important that we um, think about putting these patients on study so we can learn more about these and what are the incidences of these, um, these diseases, these side effects also specifically, in addition, of course, to how effective are they. Yeah. Um, and I did hear, hopefully it's not a secret because someone told me, so I'm just going to say it. Destiny Pan Tumor is opening cohorts to look at low. Um, so that is opening and um, all three of us actually um, are part of different studies in the BNT323, which is enrolled continuously 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus to a very similar ADC, um, mainly in endometrial, but we have ovarian and cervix experience as well that's continuing and that data will continue to come out. So this is one of the like, our biggest challenges. I'm so glad um, trastuzumab direct skin is available because many patients can't access trials and they need access to this drug. It's been transformative for many, but we have got to figure out how to test, who to test, and then when to use the drug. So trials are still really key. Um, but let's get back to pneumonitis because there's a question about that. So I'll go to Dr. Pathuri. Two like identical scenarios. Patient's great. She's responding. You know, CT with some patchy ground glass opacities. Cannot rule out infectious or inflammatory causes. Clinically correlate. That's what it says. Oh, I know. They always say that. What do you do? Non-specific mm -hmm. findings. So I think um, you know. We learned um, with our experience, you know, with the um, DB1303 that uh, HER2 ADCs, the way to manage pneumonitis is to hold the drug, even if the patient is asymptomatic. If they have asymptomatic findings on CT, you need to hold the drug, and then you need to refer them to a pulmonologist for a consult and have them weigh in in terms of whether they think this is a drug-induced pneumonitis. Um, and before you uh, continue, oftentimes what they tell me to do is hold the drug, we re-image, or they'll say start steroids, and then we re-image re after a month. And then once the um, findings have resolved, we will get the patient back on treatment. But this is very different than the way we manage our IO um, pneumonitis or the way we manage our um, you know, FR alpha pneumonitis in scenario one. Um, and, and if we don't do that, we have seen patients that progress really rapidly and, um, and can get very sick. So I think it's a, a key difference. Um, and, you know, I learned from Katie that, you know, the breast folks have already learned this because they're ahead of us in terms of um, treatment with trastuzumab deruxtecan. And I think as we're talking about this, this is one of the most important things we can take away is how we manage these um, asymptomatic pneumonitis in, with HER2 ADCs. Yeah, I think the key thing is, um, and this training needs to get out, the, the CT won't say pneumonitis, it'll say, fibrotic changes or patchy infiltrate or ground glass opacity and your patient may have had waxing and waning all of that like her whole like lifetime with you but if it happens while she's taking one of these drugs you need to hold um and work it up and it may the pulmonologist may be like this isn't anything and you're like fine keep treating but you have to do that the, these drugs work so well to be honest like we're so afraid to hold things in a terminal setting that we kind of push through but these drugs work so well if they're working that you have a lot of grace to get this worked up. They are not going to just rapidly progress. Um, so really try to um, embed this in your brains as we move this out so that we can um, make sure we don't have to have the same steep learning curve that breast had when this rolled out. Um, so I want to move to just the other questions to come back to your talk, Dr. Puthuri, on um, oh, would I treat a patient with MERV the same way? Good question. I'm going to answer it really quick. And then we're going to talk about length of PARP. Um, yes. So MERV grade one asymptomatic, you can keep treating with close follow-up. And it very rarely progresses. Now we're still following that with post-marketing um, surveillance. 
But even the current study of IMG-151 grade one, which is totally asymptomatic, we can keep treating and keep an eye on it. We don't have to hold. So it's very different if you grew up with MERV and now you're trying to use this. You're, you really have to manage them differently and be quite cautious. So thank you for asking that question so we could clarify. I think it was, it's the same with IO that you were just bringing up. But let's go back to PARP. Someone asked the question. Um, there was another question too, so let's answer these two in our last minute. What are the tests that you send on a newly diagnosed patient with epithelial ovarian cancer? What are the, the tests that you both are sending at diagnosis? And PARP, you start a PARP inhibitor for whatever reason. Um, how does the length matter? Two versus three years, someone wants to know. Yeah. Sure, you can start. Yeah, Go ahead. Sure. Um, so in terms of testing, uh, obviously genetic testing, right? Everyone, every patient with ovarian cancer should have genetic testing. Um, in addition, we do somatic testing, which includes, um, we use um, an NGS panel um, that also includes um, an HRD score and utilize those data in terms of defining how we would like to treat our patient in the maintenance setting. And I don't use BEV on all patients. I use BEV on you know patients who are high risk. And then, and then if I've started BEV, then I will just add a lap rib if they're HRD positive. And if they're HRP, then I just continue the BEV. And um, the other question was the length of treatment. It depends on which drug I use. I follow the study. If I did Olaparib, I will do two years. If I use Niraparib, I will do um, three years. I think we're over, probably over-treating, and I think that, you know, we've had some, there's a, a really nice energy concept that is looking to try to de-escalate this to one year. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, we can move that trial. It's a pragmatic trial, which is really important. And I'm hopeful that that will answer our question so we can use less of this and, and preserve quality of life for our patients. You want to have anything to add with testing, Dr. Bacchus, or like yeah. your thoughts on length? <clears throat> um, length, I do the similar thing. Um, two years I've followed the trials. I definitely don't keep patients on longer. Um, we just haven't really seen the, the benefit of that. And from the solo one data, the data is there that even when we stop at the two years, that overall survival benefit persists and doesn't all of a sudden drop off after we stop the drug. So um, I think we have good evidence there that a limited time period should be sufficient. As far as testing, um, we don't do um, NG, full panel NGS necessarily on all patients right at diagnosis. Um, I do journal line testing and then a um, for somatic testing, it's HRD score with a companion diagnostic. So for both Niraparib and Olaparib, that is the Myriad My Choice um, genomic instability score. So use that, and then at the time of recurrence, usually we'll send um, full NGS testing. So with slightly it. different. And when are you doing your IHC for folate and now HER2? And we'll tr we're trying to, uh, we're done it really um, for folate, receptor testing, either added on um, at the time of recurrence, just on our primary specimens. Um, we don't always send it out right from the beginning because they may never need it again. For her too, we're working with our pathologist to really say, hey, there's drug available. Can we please do this from the beginning so we have that information available across all um, GYN cancers? Yeah. Anything you're doing different with IHC? We're doing the same thing right now, but I, I really would just like to not miss it and have it ready when my patient, you know, so I can get the drug in quickly. So we're looking at trying to just do it earlier. All up front. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we are actually a little bit over. So I'm going to um, stop there, even though there's a couple other questions. So I do apologize. I couldn't get to all your excellent questions. But thank you so much for sending them in. This was a very engaged um, audience um, at lunchtime and on the last day of the almost last day of the meeting. So I appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CVY860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Azi Incorporated, Immunogen Incorporated, Cariofarm Therapeutics, and Merck and Company Incorporated. To Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partners, the Foundation for Women's Cancer and the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.